Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Marissa. Hi, Paula. So, Hello, Andre. <laughs> welcome everyone to Atlantica Talks, Contemporary Art in Angola. Um, today, this is the first of three talks and we'll be discussing today curating in Angola. There are two further talks um, later on um, this month or next month. Um, so our conversation is gonna be based on this book that came out last year, um, Atlantica Contemporary Art from Angola and its Diaspora. Um, and I wanna begin by thanking Hangar for inviting me to moderate this conversation um, with two really fascinating um, and smart curators. Paula Nascimento and Andre Cunha. Um, so we're gonna sort of revisit the interview that Paul Goodwin did with Paula and Andre in the book. Um, but I wanna just begin by asking each of them to introduce themselves um, and say a little bit about what drives your curatorial practice and work. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Paola Nascimento. I'm an architect and curator based in um, Luanda. I've been working as an independent curator since 2010, um, focusing on interests and, and thematic threads around um, you know, contemporary cities, uh, urbanism, relationship between art and architecture, um, construction of identities, mostly working on inter and transdisciplinary projects. Okay. Um, I am Andre Cunha. Um, I'm a golden curator. I'm based out of Lisbon for the past two years now. Um, um, I started curating and um, I'm interested in relationship between art and politics and the whole Portuguese or um, Portuguese speaking um, African countries. So all the relationship between them and uh, the happenings between them. Great, thank you. I also just want to invite any, uh, anybody in the, in the audience, as it were, um, to please feel free to send us questions or comments in the um, question and answer section of your Zoom screen. We'd love to, to hear from you. Um, so I wanted to just, uh, aside from asking you to introduce yourselves, begin by um, having you talk a little bit about what cur curatorial practice and curatorial work consists of. I think that, um, you know, today the idea of curating has become sort of, um, if not uh, banal through different practices of social media, it's certainly become much more commonly used. Um, but I think it's got a more ample history and practice. And I'm wondering if each of you could speak to that a little bit. What does, what is curating? What is curatorial work? I mean, it can start with, starts with writing in my case. Um, course something sparks an interest um, it, it for me has a lot to do with the feel of the city or the place where you are and and it starts with writing um, and then from there it develops um, in Luanda at the time that I was there at least it was very hard sometimes for projects to go beyond the writing part because the money for research isn't there, the, maybe the structures. So it would always start with writing and then conceptualizing what it is that you want to say in conjunction with the artists that are experiencing what you're experiencing or others that you can relate to. Um, I think that adding to, to what Andre said, um, I think that the research part is, 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 you know, for me, one of the most important issues, whether I'm uh, myself researching a theme of reference or, you know, construction of Angolan identity or how, uh, you know, contemporary art has been played in, in the country, but also uh, sometimes just working on smaller issues in art and trying to articulate 
uh, what different artists are trying to say with uh, themes of interest to me or with the wider wider spectrum of conversation and discourses that are happening both in the region and uh, globally as well yeah yeah um so that's that's super interesting and of course i'm obviously interested in writing and research as well as an historian <laughs> um i do lots of that so i'm wondering um, <laughs> when you say research where are you doing like what does research consist of in your practice i mean possibly it looks different every time you do it that certainly is the truth for me when I do research, no matter where that is. Um, but I'm just wondering what kinds of um, uh, what kinds of things are you looking for when you're doing research? Are you reading books? Are you talking to people? Are you looking for material? Um, for me, it, 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 yeah, I don't have a fixed methodology. And, mm -hmm. and the reason for that being because um, some of, I wouldn't say all of them, but some of my projects, for example, started with, not with a curatorial, uh, a priori thought in mind, mm -hmm. but as uh, a means to sort of try to discover and articulate different fields or different dis practices, mm -hmm. uh, or to sort of try to articulate what's happening. Um, a lot of my early work also has to do with the experience of Luanda. So whether I'm uh, collaborating with artists or with other architects or with writers or researching what people have felt and said about um, about the city, about the experience of the city. I mean, there are all these different layers. Sometimes I, you know, I just do field trips where I'm mapping stuff or I'm observing people or talking to people, but then it, it, it always falls back to bringing that, all of those different findings back also to a theoretical uh, and wider spectrum of, of uh, uh, discourses and dialogues, I think. Yeah, I, I echo what you say, because it's, you connect the sensorial with the, with the intellectual part, which you just go at it within your computer screen. Um, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you connect it with, with wherever or whatever you are doing. It's, uh, it's the sensorial meets the, the global part of it because you can't disconnect yeah. from what is happening within your region and globally and just next door. So uh, all sorts of uh, inputs coming in, in all directions. It's a bit impossible yeah, to separate yeah. oneself like an island. Yeah, yeah and sometimes um, I also feel that the exhibition, it's not necessarily the end product. It's yeah. part of this process. So it's a moment when you feel that you have something that you can share with the public, that you need, you know, the, the scrutiny, you need the confrontation. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's an unfolding practice where actually the exhibition never is the end product, but is also part of a process, part of a research process. And um, yeah. Sometimes the part that you end up showing is not really the most interesting <laughs> part as well, <laughs> especially working in, in the context of Angola, which is sometimes it's so hard to make things work that you finish a project and a specificity of that project becomes your focus point to the next. And it has, you know, you don't show it, maybe a part of production. It's, it's interesting, just little details mm -hmm. that, uh, turn out to be more important than the end project itself. Can you give us um, an example of that in your own, something that you, that's happened? Or were, you know, uh, sure. Um, when I started, um, I did a cinema cycle here for Angar a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, about Angolan cinema. And that led me to, uh, searching a bit of Antonio Wall's uh, personal archives. And I came upon, there was a time in the public television, TPA, uh, they had, they did films in the television bureaucracy itself. And then they had a cinema laboratory that also worked. So as I was searching for, you know, doing the movie cycle or a cinema cycle and then getting into research, the 
it's just the thread that connects you to documents that are uncovered or have been lost or um, or are in people's houses. Um, so it's you know little things that will drive you and then can become a much bigger project. You can digitize all these archives. It has been done in uh, in, in, in other in Mozambique, for example, by the own state. So that's an example. Interesting, Paula. Do you have any specific examples of of how you you know a particular exhibit where you feel like it's really just a step in the process and and maybe even your your thinking about um, the project changes through the exhibition? Um, sure. In uh, let's say 2014, um, I I started a project called Iled Saint George, which uh, really started as um almost like a, a continuation of Luanda Encyclopedic City that I did the year before with that Chagas, but on you know on a more challenging way because it's a project where we started to really engage more with the modern legacy of the city of, of Luanda, but then trying to expand the conversation into the Portuguese speaking African country. And that led to a video exhibition. Uh, of which part of the project actually failed, but then part of the project didn't fail, and we we managed to do a publication with some authors. And it, it's one of these projects that it's very dear to me because I think that my understanding of the subject and my position and critical thinking about how this legacy has been um, absorbed or has had influences in the way that we use these cities has changed a lot and so i've you know this year revisited the project uh, that project also generated a number of films from the artists that i was working with that then generated other projects one of them for example um monica de miranda's film hotel globo came from a residency that andre did with monica in luanda and it then evolved into we collaborating in a project that's called panorama that then expands this research into, into Luanda, but other cities of Angola. And, and this year I was, I was challenged to, to revisit the format and, and funny enough engaged also with other artists that had a more, con more actual view of, of these cities and, and, and other inputs to, to sort of change a little bit the initial view of the exhibition. So, uh, yeah, it's it's an ongoing uh, research that that happens in the background sometimes with uh, inputs from other projects, and that has led me to kind of uh, morph the whole even thinking of that of that mobile cinema that it's in a way how how I call it. Interesting, and some of that some of those films are now in the Hangar online video section. Isn't that yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's exciting. So, you know, but those, it's got another life and another iteration um, here in the, in the interwebs, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> so I was interested to hear you both say that um, Luanda um, as an urban space and as a place mm -hmm. in which you live and work or lived and work um, was really central to thinking about curating and to your practice. Um, could each of you say a bit more about that and, and, and help, like maybe we can think a little bit about what is the relationship between Luanda and Angola when we think about curating and, and how much is Luanda, um, I'm also, you know, obsessed with Luanda. Um, <laughs> but, so, and how much is, how much is Luanda, um, you know, how much is that sort of maybe an artifact of our current um, moment or the last, you know, maybe 20 years versus if we, you know, think more historically about um, the relationship between uh, the capital and the rest of the country or the, or, and also what was the colonial capital um, and we think about sort of artistic practice um, and maybe even curating. Um, well, Paula before me, uh, because you were born in what late 70s, early 80s, which is utter <laughs> chaos. Uh, uh, when I was born, it's utter chaos as well. It's pretty dystopic place. So that influences a lot 
the city itself is so full of inputs, so sensorial all the time that it's you you don't turn off. Um, that made an impact. The social conditions, everything. The city itself was very insular. People traveled by airplane. The country and the city were different things. It's such a mix of everything. Um, it became a full-time job trying to decipher these two different beings that was Luanda and the rest of the country. So that that came in a lot into thinking about curating as an escape, not as an escape, but a way of thinking that, thinking the city and its influence to the rest of the country and the influence to the region and the whole political ensemble that made you be where you are. So it became also a site of reflection then. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. A reflection, um, a reflection and escape as well. And just thinking about it has to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that from the side of reflection, definitely, uh, it's it's an important entry point. Um, no, I wasn't born in the late seventies. I was born <laughs> in the early eighties. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, so I said the two. <laughs> but, but I um, now that you ask this question, I, I two things came to my mind. One was uh, when I left the city, obviously in you know early 90s and I lived abroad for 20 years and for a period of time when I lived with my grandmother sometimes as we were chatting she would talk about Luanda but referring to Angola which I think that it's a paradox that very often happens here and that you know as as we become more critical as we're growing up and so on and and, and especially today you know there is this awareness that you know the country is not Luanda the country is bigger than that and it's more interesting and varied than that but in a way the, 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 there's always been this sort of sense that because it's the capital because there's been a flux of people here since the 90s um, like any capital city is also the center where a lot of things happen and and i think that's been also the center in a way this capital of of the art production not that there isn't there aren't things happening outside of Luanda and that there aren't a lot of interesting things uh but then added to that uh very recently i i, I heard that uh, from a filmmaker of my our generation saying that Luanda is the inspiring muse of our generation and it is and i think that having lived abroad for such a long time uh, my entry point into the city is obviously as an architect trying to think and decipher this congestion, the chaos, the self-organization, and all these layers that the city has, the history, the survival aspects. Um, and in a way, I actually think that in trying to create methodologies to address these issues, uh, somehow my curatorial practice evolved because I found that the, a way to be able to discuss, to address these issues, to articulate them also then with other cities of the continent with other cities outside of the continent so yeah i think that uh, it is a critical point still mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we're based here or we're not and you know, andre is not based here at the moment but we often come back to the city and we speak from here to the world is 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 not an accidental um, uh, point in our in our trajectory yeah yeah, well, it's a it's a fascinating and incredibly dynamic city, and has been yeah. for very, very <laughs> for centuries, I think, um, and a, and a uh, and a one that's important globally to lot to lots of things. So I'm I'm interested in something that um, Andre said about um, when he um, or the kind of chaos of the of the <laughs> 70s and 80s, because I you know I and 90s. <laughs> I started studying a kind of earlier period, but I and um, but one that you know ex has increasingly extended or, or become more tightly focused on the um, seventy five and after seventy four and after. Um, and one of the things that I have noticed as an historian is that there really isn't much that's been written about this period. Now, some people would say it's too recent. 
Um, but really, you know, 70, 1975 was now 45 years ago. So um, mm -hmm. there's been plenty of time to reflect. And one of the things that I also notice is that people tend to um, forget. I mean, the time is described as chaotic um, or people say, you know, oh, there's nothing left from them. People assume that there are no artifacts or no sources or um, less frequently that there's no one to talk to. But I do think it's interesting and I'm interested in going back to that period and thinking much more about um, what was going on and what the state was doing and what people were doing um, in terms of cultural policy, you know, what the state was doing in terms of cultural policy, what people were doing in, in terms of everyday life um, and things like that. Um, I, I think sometimes we, we, we tend to forget about that stuff and sometimes there aren't a lot of artifacts to necessarily remind us, but there are some, like maybe the, the mural around the, the military hospital um, mm -hmm. and, and other things. Um, so I, I feel like there's sort of a gap between, you know, a sense that, um, oh, now is the moment in which things are going on, a sense of newness. Um, and much of the discussion, I think, around artistic production um, in Angola and in Luanda is a conversation that's about, um, it's a post-2002 conversation. Um, so I just wanted to see if we could maybe think about um, what if we push that back a little bit? I mean, I know Susana Saza, another um, Angolan curator, has said, you know, well, it's not that there was no curation going on. There were people doing things, artists, um, either alone or in groups, uh, organized shows and exhibits. Um, Andrea, you in the in the interview with Paul also mentioned um, the the kind of collaborative work between Antonio Ol and Rui Duarte de Carvalho as another kind of model or way of thinking about curating in the past. So I'm wondering if maybe we can like spend a few minutes just thinking about like what were other um, curatorial practices going on and artistic uh, forms of artistic production, um, sort of maybe you know even in the late colonial period but certainly since 1975 so that we can all begin um to sort of deepen uh, our history i think of of artistic production and curatorial practice in angola <laughs> um, <Boom. laughs> yeah it's a bit you know and it's, it's um i'm more re we're more recent um but um one thing is, no, there isn't much written. Um, access to uh, documents, as you know, is not easy. Um, some things have been destroyed, some things you don't know that it has been destroyed or not. You are just not given access nor the knowledge of the existence. So that is one problem right there. Um, secondly, the universities themselves don't have research funds to push their students into doing this research work that requires payment and it takes a lot of time and it's tedious sometimes, especially in the conditions that you have to go through to find these documents. Um, and then also access to people is very limited. Um, so I'd say that in my, in my experience were the major problems into um, getting access to documentation, official state documentation, because as you said, these were programs developed by the state. It was Stadu Unico, only party. Um, so everything came from the state. Um, if you don't have access to those documents, then it's a, a blank part of history. And um, we're a bit left <laughs> uh, trying to imagine things, which sometimes isn't all that bad. Um, but when you find things in private collections and private archives of artists or curators or writers that store their documents and then their families make them available, then that's always another step to uncovering something else. And they're always, always in your mind to write things, but as you uncover more documents and more information, then you can start to create more um, robust images of things instead of just conjecturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think that if we, uh, there are hints. It's yeah. not like, uh, yeah. you know, as, as Marisa said, we have this big mural and uh, 
if we, for example, were uh, researching on the, the history of the contemporary urban art or urban interventions, we have to go back to understand the political role of those murals played in a wider context. And that, that was part of the cultural policy uh, uh, prior post transition independence yes. period. Uh, right after that, we have UNAP. <laughs> 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 UNAP is the, the, the National Artists Union uh, and it's an organization that was founded was it late 70s uh, I think that with the aim of somehow kind of decolonizing the arts uh, in, 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 in a sort of uh, utopical wishing not so much in terms of research but a kind of like let's return to our roots style um, and they exist up to today. I think that what, what obviously as an organization, and we've kind of witnessed some of those changes, it, it changed, evolved, transformed, and became much more of a political um, um, uh, union than uh, perhaps uh, an association that has a lot of cultural relevance today. But I think that it's also, um, uh, critical to address those changes uh, but it's not easy because as Andres said we either we have to go and search for the process of document finding it's really difficult and you know and it's tedious but it's nevertheless worth doing um sure otherwise uh, some be some people yeah some some people are still alive we can still get uh some oral uh, uh documents but I, I i also think that uh, you know, we have UNAP, from UNAP you have some gaps, we have periods where nothing, almost nothing happened, we had the Luanda Triennial in, in, in early 90s, uh, mm -hmm. but I think that like everything that, that's, that has an, an history relation here, we're, we're always too shy and akin to, to really unpack. The, there are many layers of uneasiness um and and so that that really um you know if i go and do some research maybe i'm you know i'm, I'm respected or i get along with everybody and i can get people to talk but uh it's not something that it's as accessible uh in a school program it's something that you have to do on your own you have to find uh, budgets and 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 and, find, and resources to do that uh, a lot of goodwill a lot of time um, and there is, for example, a lot of information in the National Archives, but it's almost impossible on your own. You go there and nobody can really give you the information. It's like, you know, you have boxes there, go and find your way around it. So it's not an easy task. I think that it's a challenging task. Mm -hmm. um, and, and perhaps that's why it's easier for, we address very much this moment, but we also address this moment because if we look back and we start to look at, even in the region, you know, South Africa, Ghana, or whatever, there's a lot more written production than we have. Uh, uh, and I, I, I often say that even to reflect upon the work that's been doing now in the past 10 years, um, it's something that we are starting to do. And we're starting to do because there, is a, there are sources also outside, there are people, artists travel a lot, they work in a wider field, there's a lot of people writing. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're yet to begin to, to write about, to write our own history of art or from our own perspective. Uh, but I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's, it, it's a challenge. And perhaps it's also something that once, we're, you know, people are able to crack, we will also understand that although Luanda, again, is, you know, an important city, there are other satellites gravitating around Luanda and other discourses that have developed and they don't even pass by Luanda, you know, they link the country to different geographies and to different um, uh, approaches than, you know, what's happening here. So, yeah, it's, uh, but it, it's, it's a challenge to engage in this, in this complexity. I think that we're just, we're just starting really. Uh, I think that's what makes it um, part of what makes it so exciting, right? There's so much potential yeah. to go in many directions, um, yeah. even as it's 
even as it's frustrating, I think, and I'm completely empathetic um, to the, <laughs> the challenges of, of doing of doing research. Um, but I also think there 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 it's there's there's lots of exciting stuff. The rewards are great. The rewards right? are great. When you yes. have a reward, it's 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 great. Yeah, and I'm thinking about I mean just a little bit that. Um, of research that I did, that Delinda and I did when we were writing the piece in Atlantica on on media, and looking at you know what what in fact was cultural policy, and actually reading the policy um, <laughs> was you know instead of just saying oh we know it was like this, um, I think actually you learn a lot when you do that, um, and I would be interested to 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 do more of that, um, and I also think Paula's comment about you know other places within the country within Angola um, and, and different dynamics going on reminds me of the work that Victor Gama has done um, with yeah. Sukaya and, you know, getting people to record um, and document uh, different forms of music um, across, um, across the Angolan territory. And I think there's, um, there's great potential for, for those kinds of things also going forward. Um, I wanted to, um, so, think a little bit more about Luanda or Angola more generally. Um, and if you could talk to us about what the art scene looks like now. So we've gone from this period in the past where there was a lot of, or right around after independence, where there was, it seems to me, some energy put into thinking about this. Also, I think Delinda Collier's work here is really important for helping us understand what was happening with, with MAP, um, with VTEX's uh, work as a as a bureaucrat promoter of the arts as well as as an artist. Um, and then there seems to be this kind of long gap, right? The, the kind of unending civil war and all these kinds of things. And, and we begin to see more movement then starting in maybe the late 90s, but certainly after 2002 and when the, the war ends. Um, and so if we look at the art scene in Luanda and Angola right now, um, it seems much less state driven. So I'm interested to have you guys just think a little bit or tell us about um, what the art scene looks like now. What institutions are there? What infrastructure is there? How and where do, do artists work, both in Luanda and outside Luanda, if you can, um, if you know about other cities? I think that we kind of uh, discovered independence as, you know, being an independent artist or an independent producer, an independent uh, curator. Uh, and 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 I, I believe that for so many years, yes, we had this we had this thing with UNAP that was a national project, and and somehow, uh, let's say in terms of, of of what was considered national art, it had to come through there. So everything else was an outsider. There were ruptures. We had the Luanda Triennial, which I think that as as a platform really uh, engaged with a completely different generation of uh, artists interested in many different things coming from different backgrounds self taught artists people that were living and capturing the moment we're talking about you know mid 90s uh, and i think that uh, you know regardless of anything that also you know was a big a good platform and brought a lot of uh, interesting artists from abroad from the region from other parts of the world to the city of Luanda again mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that movement also you know showed people that there are other ways to engage in, in the art practice um, and I think that from that on uh, we've had also again moments where nothing happened or nothing seemed to be happened to a period that I particularly find very interesting because it's totally decentralized. Uh, everybody's doing their own thing uh, and people are finding mechanisms to do what they want to do. Whether, you know, you still have um, that sort of master and apprenticeship uh, types of ateliers with paintings or with uh, sculptures doing more traditional work, but then you have um, a younger generation of photographers uh, gathering uh, in collectives and, and developing their own works and languages, uh, finding their, their way around, you know, to navigate, whether in Luanda, outside of Luanda. Um, we now have a number of galleries, not many, but we have five, so, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're a tiny, tiny 
thing, but uh, they brought also with, with, with a lot of critical issues, uh, um, other, other types of, uh, of gatherings, of, of groupings, of artists in, you know, engaging in, in, in different um, uh, practices. Uh, you know, younger curators, I mean, the figure of the curator, yes, we had people doing curatorial work before, but the professional figure of the curator is something that it's emerging. And, and I think that with that decentralization, we, we gain, everybody gain more because we have a young, fertile um, scene. Uh, I still think that there is a lack of critical engagement uh, mm -hmm. because once it becomes when you get, you know, a number of galleries and, 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 and everything becomes too commercial, it's about selling and survival. We still have a lot of artists that are struggling to survive. So, you know, the, the practices are driven by uh, the fact that you can sell a number of paintings to be able to, 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 to eat, not necessarily addressing critical issues, but everything is happening now. I mean, it's like a big melting tray um where a few things will remain others will not but but i i particularly enjoyed the fact that, that, that there's no center mm -hmm. anymore i don't know if you agree with me andre i do i do i was thinking that right now what i can see is from outside so internet mm -hmm. and from there you get that perception that things are decentralized as you are a one person company and you do what must be done to put your project on its feet uh, and that relates to talking to getting your message across so it gets across um, also you you can see what is lacking which is some sort of support because it's yeah. unfeasible to continue this same process that we are all one women man show and it's not sustainable um so uh, although it's a very interesting moment to be at and to see the strategies that people are coming up to for survival eff effectively uh it's 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 very nice to see it and and to find a way to to approach it in a way that builds something and not just gets this sort of continuation but um it's the the force is there <laughs> so it's, it's it sounds like what you're saying is there, there's a lot of energy um and people are doing things despite the fact that they don't necessarily have uh state support right um and the mm -hmm. state or even or even uh or even um private support private because support. uh private support comes tagged with a lot of things you know you want to it's mostly with the commercial galleries and you want to be able to show what you are doing so that limits the scope of projects that you can realize so until private entities figure out that there is another way of gain through the funding of projects that do not show immediately what you are doing then you will see an evolve, evolving of the scene and thinking of a long-term um, long timeline instead of just a very short one, which is what happens yeah. in terms of institutions, I feel. Not, again, not with cultural actors, because you always have to think very, various steps ahead to, to be functioning. But the entities seem to be thinking in a very, um, short-term short-term memory sort of thing and you can see that ministries and uh, political power yielders are constantly changing their places so there's no continuity of work uh, or if there is it's a very difficult one when you have to always give it up to the next person right and the economy is going down to cultural policy <laughs> yeah exactly it comes down Again. everything to cultural <laughs> policy for sure which we don't have at the moment, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that uh, also to forcing uh, these entities to really think of culture in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. This is something that, you know, the, the cultural actors are always way ahead, let's say, in terms of our, you know, state policy, probably in 18th, 19th century. Uh, yeah. So 
you know, it's it's difficult to to, to dialogue in, yes. in that sense. <laughs> dialogue is is very difficult, and um, when that is shut closed, is is very complicated. But one finds uh, strategies um, to yeah. to create or other points of dialogue. It has to be done, so you always mm -hmm. find strategies. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that so cultural policy, when it exists, is sort of doing one thing. Um, and I think there's been a lot of turnover, particularly in recent years, in the Ministry of Culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and most, you know, yeah. even in the past, what is it, two months, right? There's now a new super <laughs> minister, um, and, and culture has been thrown in with with um, environment and other mm -hmm. uh, and other things. Tourism. That I think complicates things. Um, and then there's um, you know very dynamic artists, sets of artists mm -hmm. both within, um, within and without the country, right? Um, curators and then private galleries. Um, and private galleries seem to be the kind of newest actors um, mm -hmm. on the scene. And so I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe think a little bit more about that. Um, as, as, as I think you both were saying, they're largely driven by commercial interests, which has up to this point not really given too much space for there to be longer term forms of thinking or longer term sorts of mm -hmm curatorial projects, right? Um, and I'm wondering to what extent are these galleries um, sort of manifesting a, dy uh, a dynamic that's very specific to Angola um, and the Angolan economy and how much are they also maybe related though to international changes and the kind of new, new wish, you know, in the past 10, 20 years focus on African contemporary art more generally. So how much are they you know, what is their relationship with what's going on outside in terms of African contemporary art and how much are they um, reflecting and making a scene that's really driven by much more local dynamics? Hmm. What do you think of it, Andre? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, shit. Um, I mean, you have, you have certainly the commercial the commercial dynamics of it is the point number one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, without naming names, um, the commercial is there, and at, at a point where Angola is, the coin has devalued 500% or 600%, you mm -hmm. cannot move money outside of the country. The art business is always a good business to move things around. So, there you have point number one. Then you have the, the past few years, the growing interest in, in African art, which makes them have connections, which I don't think are deep enough to the rest of the region in Africa and to uh, the diasporas or even just other types of art. So I think that the connections are very superficial because Africa is what the market wants now. But as the, the market, acts as if I want something, I want it now, and then you discard it. So it's, if they can go beyond this relationship, and I know there is one or other gallery that works with a very good Angolan artist that either live there or not, that have another approach whose work is highly political. Uh, so I think within the galleries, you have a separation of how things happen. But as Paula said, it's five, four, five, six galleries, so it's, it's a drawn line and also it has to be dialogue because it's such a small scene that mm -hmm. you do not really want to, or you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so it is, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that uh, I I agree with you when when you say that the yes the, the I mean if you're a gallery you you know you're participating in fairs in discourses that are happening uh, across uh, across the continent and 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 in other parts of the world and sometimes uh, and I totally agree with you when you say that yes there are this these links these threads that are being uh, drawn up but still in a very sort of light and and not deep sense but yeah. but i also believe that that's that's, that's a process and it, it's funny because we have galleries we have 
a public that goes to openings that is a very small public is the same people that we meet everywhere and and so there is this seems to be also a responsibility which is something that i've more than ever now i'm thinking uh, 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 to actually engage the audiences here and to educate the public here uh, so in a sense you don't really have a lot of a market here you know you, you and 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 that's a critical aspect of countries like Zimbabwe do, you know, they're almost like they have a good, good generation of artists, but they produce basically to feed the, you know, markets outside of Zimbabwe. So I think that it's, it's an issue that we, we as professionals, whether artists, curators and, and, uh, and gallerists, I think that we need to reflect upon and devise strategies to really, uh, improve the local scene is difficult but we have to do it i mean it's you know we're here um, and and then to sort of strengthen these relations with with the continent i see i see those relationships being uh, more sort of clearly drawn uh, from you know either artists themselves or even curators who are working across projects than uh, with with commercial galleries really for sure so um, I think that's really interesting. I mean, what I hear you saying is that there are these links between, you know, um, the different dynamics, but there's a kind of un unevenness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways that um, it's, again, left to sort of individuals to work it out um, mm -hmm. or um, see what might be, might be possible. Um, but it does seem like um, curators are probably key sort of are, are potentially really key figures in, in all of this. Um, we had a question from one audience member. It's the, the mm -hmm. Guns and Rain um, yeah. folks um, who, who are asking about whether there's been experimentation or thought about using sort of hybrid models of commercial um, curatorial practice. Um, and it, you know, is there a possibility for that? Um, I think that there is a possibility for that. Uh, I think that as Andres said, perhaps we have one gallery that kind of operates in, in this realm. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's, uh, but it, it can only be a midterm project because the investment that you have to do yourself in this is, 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 is humongous. But I think that we also are in, in a position to really invent or test models that we want i mean for a long period of time i think that uh, when i said before that we discovered independence it, it's almost like we it's almost redundant for us uh, andrea myself or even Susanna, or someone else to present ourselves as independent curators because that's the only status that we could have here uh you know we don't have institutions we're not museums we're not working with any of those things and yeah. by default uh for example, I've worked with a lot of experimental models. Um, my first collective, Beyond Entropy, was a hybrid practice, and we tried to always tag in into institutions, into politics, into. But that the investment of that was a personal investment, mm -hmm. and it paid off in terms of outcome. But you know, the collective ended because it became unsustainable. So I think that we do have room for testing this ground, and for obviously, you know, it's a trial and error to learning and, and creating more hybrid models. And we have space for that, uh, you know, it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, I agree with you. I, I think that as, as Paula said that we are independent and the amount of capital that we hold is not the same as galleries. It has to be something coming from them as the capital building. Yeah. And they thread a line that they cannot always cross. So it's a very delicate situation for the connection to be made, for it to be meaningful in a, in a building way, instead of just setting up an exhibition with, with the little talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it just, it seems that there's still good ways to go in terms of developing a kind of, um, whatever, a, like a sustainable ecology, right? Where you have, yeah many many more of these kind of pieces in place whether it's 
from the from a public right mm -hmm. um from from and, and also having i think uh consumers or people who purchase who are collectors who are educated um and can and can also support research and, and education from the state um from from artists from galleries and then from the you know maybe the possibility of down the line more independent institutions like museums foundations mm -hmm. um these kinds of these kinds of things um one of the other things i think is quite interesting that you both have raised and raised earlier is the question of um a lack of criticism and this also seems a kind of really um important and missing piece of this of this ecology um could i could one or both of you say something more about you know the sort of state of, of art criticism in Angola um, and where um, where it could go, where it might come from, what what criticism you know would need. I mean, we now have there's now Isaac, there's at least one you know sort of upper level or tertiary level school for training in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they they do much um, art criticism training or things like that, but um, I think this is a really interesting and important question for thinking about. You know, what is also the how do how does art have also a kind of a, a social and cultural presence, right? beyond galleries and beyond um, the specific work itself. I think from the art schools, it's very difficult because their programs are very antiquated. So um, in terms of critical thinking and, and relating to, I mean, just getting to the point that I can actually write and put it out there because right now it's the internet that works. So there isn't critical thinking enough to gather a large amount of students and push them in that direction. Um, and so we wait for a new generation. We ourselves sometimes write, but it's always, you know, from an outsider point of view, you don't delve into it that much because we are producing projects and we are doing them. And sometimes it's counterproductive, but there's a new generation seeing things happening and, and they can write it and, and criticize and start their own, don't have to wait for anything or anybody because support is not coming, um, at least for now. Schools, uh, universities, their, their, their programs don't push the students, um, they don't give them research time, so that could come from there, but it doesn't happen. So it would, ha it would need an institutional push or you just start it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that education is key. I mean, we've had we've had periods where we had uh, uh, good criticism, even published on the national newspapers. Yes. Uh, but yes, the, there's been like a, a big hiatus from that moment on, and uh, and I think that it's also a hiatus of appearing people. I mean, now you know, engaging with the younger generation, we see, you know, interested people, people that are writing, despite the, the fact that they might not publish or not, or they might or might not publish, uh, but they keep doing it. But I think that we need to sort of go back to a culture of criticism that also goes beyond the fact, I mean, you know, Luanda is an island, come on, almost. We, it's tiny. Uh, yes. As I said, I'm producing shows. I will not criticize Andrea's shows. My friend will probably go have a drink and talk about it uh, if I have something to say. But to sort of move beyond that little bubble that we live in and criticism that is really addressing uh, issues on a, on, a, on a wider scale, I think that there, there is a lack of that. And that needs to come from people who are doing this professionally, I think or that are training and, you know, trying, they're pushing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the role. The, I think that the academy will have a role in that, an important role in that. We, uh, um, we're also seeing recently things like workshops for critical writing, peering. I, you know, two years ago, I ran a short one that was, but, the, but then again, I mean, it was funded by, as part of a project by an a project by international magazine sort of run a contemporary and uh, yes. and and we did a small workshop it and we could see that the limited there, was, there were limited seats but the interest of of the the students or people coming from different fields to write about culture 
to learn, uh, to, to look at things was, was highly. And everybody had so many issues to discuss. But then between that and becoming a professional, it's a whole other scene. Um, and, and I think that it's also the, the issue of publishing, you know, how would a newspaper open a, a criticism a session in, in its cultural field? I mean, you know, the media here informs, but yeah. that's doesn't, it. Yeah, it doesn't create you know, this so, Yeah, so I, I, I think that this definitely has an impact on what is produced and the way that we produce and consume what is done here. And, um, but, but I see that we have space to grow. Uh, how we will do that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think criticism is clearly so important. But as you pointed out, Paul, I mean, there's like, there's a lot of interest. And I think that's always um, exciting and heartening to see. But sometimes there's a big gap between people's um, the desire and the interest and how to get to a place where you have a kind of um, professional um, or more developed criticism and then having the venues in which it can be published um, as well as the sort of, you know, some sort of continuity between a workshop um, mm. and, and people's, um, and, yeah. you know, like there's not, there aren't the educational institutions or even necessarily the professional um, organizations mm -hmm. that can help uh, people get from their interest to, to being able to actually mm -hmm do do the criticism. Um, we have a couple of more questions here. Um, one is very, uh, again, around the question of, of criticism, a question from Walton Muyumba, um, mm -hmm. asking us, so what is the role of art critics in growing the gallery and, and curatorial culture? Um, and ought critics to be locally grown in Angola um, or on the continent? I mean, I think it, it, that's actually an interesting question to think about, you know, are there, um, are there South African critics um, writing about Angolan art? Are there um, Senegalese art critics writing about Angolan art? And um, uh, and you know how do we how do we think about that criticism as well? Hmm. Um, Good question. I think that um, there have been people visiting Luanda, visiting the art scene that end up writing in, in one way or another. Uh, but it's not a usual thing. So I don't think there's a, it's not part of the route that critics might take within the continent or globally um, to go by Luanda and see what is happening. Um, so you would have to be local for starts to, or be just local, either from there or living there, um, to be writing from there. Um, and then as that gets picked up, because that can get picked up for other publications, you don't really need to send your critics um, to wherever you need. Um, that can be pick up, picked up and it can explode the scene. It can drive people to come in and do their own criticism. And of course, then to be part of the route, there needs to be more events. And for this, you need the institutional help to bring out people. Otherwise, you need research funds, and it's part of your project to go through Luanda or Angola or wherever. Um, and while there, you do reports, and you know. Yeah. Well, certainly the triennials, right, attracted more attention and yeah. more, and a kind of a, a larger um, public and visitors and things like that. But it does seem that um, there's been a, sh you know, there are different moments. We can talk about sort of different moments even since um, the early 2000s really and it's, and it's shifted in some ways. Um, we have a couple more questions here. Um, Nagata Kadumu, who is herself a curator, um, mm -hmm. asks about to what extent do you think that museums and other kinds of non-commercial exhibiting institutions in Angola um, can support the kinds of endeavors that you were talking about earlier, the sort of um, uh, kind of curatorial or hybrid research, um, et cetera? Um, okay, I think that uh, I think that first we need to establish that uh, we have very few museums here. I mean, we've grown up without our museums, basically. So that already sets the tone for the context. Uh, we do have, you know, a few important museums, anthropology, ethnology, but 
those institutions themselves um, are very state reliable and they don't have funding for anything. So often what happens is that uh, some of us, I mean, it's happened at least with me that I did a project that it was good to happen at a museum. And so we approach the museum and we actually are the ones sort of helping the institution uh, by bringing funds from our projects or by being able to do an exhibition there. And when you do an exhibition there, you'll end up refurbishing the room where you're doing the exhibition. You have discussions with museums directors and look at um, you know what they have in the museum and how you could help. Very often, it's, it's been happening like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think that it's up to to really shifting the way even the state is thinking about culture, because then these institutions can also be empowered and 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 they they operate under a very hierarchical mode where by everything comes from a central power. I mean, you have directors, you have staff, local staff, but decisions come from central power. So it's even difficult for a museum to say, uh, okay, somebody from Smithsonian came to Luanda, visited the Anthropology Museum. Oh, we have pieces from Angola. We want to create some sort of partnership or, or you know, program of training or continuous, unless this comes then from a central decision making. It ends up being a conversation only. So um, if those institutions don't change, it's difficult for them to help us. And I think that what's been happening is that it's easier for us to help the institutions because some <laughs> of us move around, because some of us move around because we, we have other connections. We, we also bring people in. And when I say we, I mean the whole spectrum of cultural actors um, yeah. operating here locally. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, we, we're kind of on the other way around and <laughs> we would need to, <laughs> I think that we would need to either to shift or within this other way, wrong way out to find some sort of way uh, to, 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 to make, you know, maybe create a more sort of fruitful relationship. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of these museums, apart from the Dundo Museum, which is is very important also, and a lot of academics go to study in pieces or have written about it mm -hmm. uh, extensively. Uh, even that, it doesn't have funding for research. Uh, it doesn't have researchers working there. So really it's, yeah, um, it, it's a funny situation. I, I just wanted to add something to the previous question about African, um, you know, like I said, African critics writing about Angolan art. Um, I think that it's an interesting point of view, but I would probably uh, think we have a lot of people now, we have a number of artists, not too many, but a number of artists being shown in international exhibitions. And we have, you know, a number, their works being written and reflected upon by a variety of writers. So I think that would, what would be interesting, at least for me today, is not to think of a Senegalese critic writing about Angolan art, but it's to think of a critic of the region engaging into the work of an artist that is Angolan, but that can operate within any context and it can make sense within you know, any context. So I think that is to have more of this, um, yeah, that kind of production. Yeah, absolutely. So here, here's another question that relates um, directly to the to the last the prior bit of conversation about um, institutions and museums. So Helen Harris is asking um, if there's any drive in your work to, or if there if you you feel any um, at all driven to institutionalize your own work in some ways, um, or do you think that that is is undesirable? I think the state can partner with us. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't feel like uh, going into the structure because it, it has happened. Uh, you know, most of us in one way or another have tried, even if just for conscience, in a conscious level, to uh, <laughs> interact in a more direct way with the institution and try to make the gears work. Mm -hmm. But you get to a point that uh, friction is so much that you do give up. It's very, very slow. So if you can partner and if your views are aligned, then, then maybe we can travel the same road. But it's very hard to do so otherwise. 
and it takes a massive mm -hmm. uh, amount of energy to deal with structures that themselves have to redefine the way they they work. Mm -hmm. So if you're fighting not only an institution but trying to tell them how to work or show them how you work, oh, this is it's non-productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree a bit with Andre. I think that it's counterproductive. I've, I, I, I do often collaborate with more institutional projects mm -hmm. uh, on, on a different field, but from a very personal perspective, I draw a very clear line of what my role would be, in the, you know, when I'm collaborating with a, a, a national project, I'm part of a team, I know that I have things to say, but, you know, th there is a, uh, a general um, uh, outcome that is very specific. Whereas I think that the fact that we actually keep our work outside of, of this, I, I, I also think that independence here means that you, you're able to work on issues that nobody else is working. Um, you know, very often we're, we're working with artists that have political uh, voices, not in terms of attacking, but they're sort of digging and unfolding and unpacking very sensitive issues. And it, you know, if you go <laughs> the institutional way, there's just no way you will be able to talk about it. And you, you know, it's clear even as you, when we're trying to do research and we go to, to talk to people. So I, I often find this, uh, I think that it's important that we understand how these institutions as outdated or not think and operate. And, and it's important to be able to dialogue to communicate, but I like to keep my work, um, it, my independent work independent, just because I have this, you know, facility to, to, to discuss and to bring in uh, issues that otherwise I wouldn't be able to, 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 to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think institutions are, and often bureaucracies, I mean, I think maybe we're talking more about bureaucracies necessarily than institutions here, um, and bureaucracies are complicated if, if necessary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and hopefully, but hopefully, you know, there will become, there are other sets of, you know, they're kind of cultural institutions, hopefully things, things like, you know, um, I don't know, fucking Globo and, and you know yeah. they, they have that have a life and have a kind of have been going on now for a while you know for a moment there, or whatever in, in historical terms i think we would think of that as a moment but they they have a kind of institutional um existence which is one that's you know uh, mm -hmm. can can speak to the state but doesn't isn't dependent on it um and i think yeah there's yeah too um because also i mean i think being independent curators is also probably pretty precarious um, sort of, sort of labor. So, <laughs> um, but I like. Yeah, but I really, also think that we need to rethink what we think institutions yeah. are. You know, and how exactly. they operate. And, and 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 as you you mentioned something like fucking fucking global that started as a, coll a collective slash institution. There are also a few others here, and 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 you could sense that this this these i don't know alternative institutions really produce more and are driven by other values and they can sort of uh, uh, perhaps have a bigger impact in the cultural scene than you know what we understand as you know the bureaucratic proper uh, institutions so how we navigate among these difficult weird terms as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly well, I think we can wrap it up here. I don't, do you either of you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us with about curating or contemporary art? Andre will be back in both the, the, the following two conversations on Atlantica. I'm uh, not today, though. I will, I will I'll have a conversation with uh, Binel Lirkan uh, mm -hmm. about his latest work. Um, and also with uh, Nadine Ziegert, who wrote a very interesting paper for Atlantica. So it would be me keeping up with, with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have a talk, not part of the Atlantica series, but on Angar Online as well, uh, as part of the Intrepid Visions exhibition that I have right. online with uh, two really, really good artists, uh, interesting artists, Philippa Cesar 
and uh, Cesar Cardoso from Cape Verde and Felipe Cesar from Portugal. So it's next week at some point. Right. <laughs> and do either of you have suggestions for, you know, perhaps people who are out there that are, um, have been listening to our conversation who are less familiar um, with mm -hmm. Angolan and Portuguese speaking artists, who would you say, like, who should people be keeping their eye on? Who's, whose work should people keep, a, keep an eye out for? Hmm. I mean, there's so many interesting people that, you know, keep an eye on the Atlantica series because <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one of a series that the, the more coming up, yeah. but the, yeah, the, 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 there are a number of interesting. And you can find there. circulation, as Paula mm -hmm. said, that you have a number of artists that do globe trotto uh, a lot mm -hmm. and show in many different places so you can keep track of them and that always leads to finding new artists that come along and that are pushed along so mm -hmm. yeah that's right. It. <laughs> right there are lots of new artists and i think and also hangar is doing a lot i know there's a new there's also a book coming out on on mozambique and um, contemporary yeah. art as well. So um, those are all great things to, to keep an eye out for. So um, let me say thank you so very much to Paula. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Hanga. Thank, thank you, you Paula. Nice thank talking you, to Andrea. you. Nice talking nice to you both. Bye-bye. <laughs> everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you for seeing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.